Hi everyone, uh, a warm welcome to our speakers and our audience on the YouTube live. Today we mark this date as an event to lighten up uh, the Christmas spirit during this uh, pandemic period. Thank you for joining our live uh, event and please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Likes and shares are highly appreciated. In previous years, Air Dialogue organized Christmas dinners uh, to bring diverse communities together and to lighten up the Christmas spirit. Past Christmas dinners had themes such as friendship, loneliness and mental health. Unfortunately, this year, as a result of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot come together. However, it cannot be an obstacle for us to share the festive spirit of joy and peace. Therefore, we are organizing this online Christmas panel titled the Let the Light In. The event aims to tackle the issues uh, of loneliness and to ensure that no one in the society feels left out, expressing a desire to further uh, relations with each other within our neighborhoods. The panel will highlight the importance of knowing and loving our neighbors. With this, I would like to give the mic to Alex, who's uh, leading uh, the Corimela uh, community. Uh, stage is yours, Alex. Uh, you're on mute. No worries. <laughs> Alfred, thank you so much. And it's lovely to be with you and to be joined uh, alongside Mary and, uh, and Sarah. And I just bring you greetings from uh, Corey Mila. Grace to you and peace this holiday season. It is a delight to be with uh, you at Air Dialogue again, and an honor to be representing the Corey Mila community. Corey Mila is an ecumenical Christian community uh, based in Ballycastle, Northern Ireland. Uh, we've been around for more than 55 years. We, we predate the troubles, but we, all, we have long been sort of associated with the work in Northern Ireland of trying to overcome divisions around sectarianism and divisions around those who have been left out of our society. And this year has posed, as it has for so many uh, different organizations and individuals, challenges about how to be a community and how to do the work of human encounter well over Zoom when it's two-dimensional rather than three uh, and in ways that keep everyone safe, but also recognize the the well-being, uh, that our own well-being is tied up with our relationships with other people. So I'm very, very pleased to be a part of this conversation this evening. The concern about loneliness that we have at this time of year and at this stage in our pandemic reality, along with the theme of let the light in, has drawn my attention to two aspects of the Christmas story that even though I'm trained as a, as a Christian minister, I hadn't really considered uh, joining together. This despite the fact that they come from the same passage in the, in, the, in the Christian scriptures in the Gospel of John, passage that is read very often around the Christmas season. One idea that's, that's brought from John is this idea of the Savior, of God's Savior being the light of the world a light that shines in the darkness and cannot be overcome. The other idea in my mind this evening is, from John is the idea of, of the Savior as Emmanuel, as, as God with us, as God with us in community. And however your own theology might allow for this idea, the coupling of Emmanuel or God with us, and the idea of God as light speaks to me about the illumination that has occurred this last year in the midst of our COVID darkness and this time of isolation. It speaks to me about the revelation that I have experienced that we ourselves are what is most vital to each one of us. And our presence with one another and with God in our midst is what is essential for good, healthy human life. We now know, I believe, just how essential our human connections how miraculous simply being with one another can be, how healing it is to be in each other's company. Not trying to do so much perhaps, uh, not trying to impress one another, simply being loved, accepted, and in one another's company. How elemental it is to the human experience to experience human beings. Having been forced to isolate and to practice distant socializing this last year, this idea that God is perhaps best understood within the midst of 
a human presence with us, that those interactions with one another gives us an insight as to what God is like, gains new credence for me. And the idea that our being in community for and with one another can provide light in this dark world seems all the more intriguing to explore. Even as you and I from different backgrounds and with different experiences gather together this evening over Zoom, even in this kind of artificial setting, there is light to be found. And I believe there is something divine in our midst, simply in our coming together. I live in Ballycastle on the north coast of Ireland, um, but today I needed to be in Belfast, uh, down in our office there. And I use that as an opportunity to go around and ring the doorbells and interact at the doorways of folks that I have not seen in months. And uh, I didn't have this conversation with you in mind, but on the way home, I was just struck by how good it was to see their eyes, even if above a mask, how good and healing it was to experience them in all three dimensions. It was like a light cutting through the darkness and a reminder that the presence we can offer one another, the gift of being with each other, speaks to something very human, but also downright divine. And so as we talk this evening about tackling loneliness so as to ensure no one feels left out, I want to suggest that this is holy work we embark on. And that loving our neighbor is not only an impulse that our different faiths or philosophies can inspire, but it is the way that we ourselves experience something life-changing and healing. It is strange in some ways that it is the absence of people this last year that has taught me in new ways uh, what is most important in my human life. And I also think that it is, it is interesting for Koimila, a, an organization that has community, not only in its name, but at the heart of what it does, uh, that community has discovered new ways of being this year because we've been forced to be a part. At Koimila, we have a residential center where about 5,000, 6,000 people come to every year. And it is to do that work of simply being together. We have worship or a time together for reflection in our creed, our, our worshiping space, the heart of our, of our community. We have worship twice a day and we've been missing that obviously over this last year. But what we have done as Koimila, as an ecumenical community is to gather online daily uh, for worship, just five minutes to be able to connect in that way and what has what we've experienced is that as each member or as many members of our community offer the day's reflection or the day's thought, um, we get to learn more about them as they tell us what they think is important about life more broadly speaking. And it is in that sort of um, building of community in this new way that we have uh, luckily been able to fight off some of that loneliness and isolation and separation but also I think um, in reaching out, also been able to reach within. And so I would like to think that as we um, talk about this work tonight, about tackling loneliness and ensuring that everyone from all different backgrounds, different faiths, different um, traditions are not left out, that those of us who may be speaking from a faith tradition can know that this is holy work that brings out the best in what is human and which gives us a glimpse uh, what is truly divine. And so I'm simply going to close then, but I'm hoping that we can come back with questions and kind of teasing out of, of these silly ideas that I've given and then the wisdom that Sarah and Mary have to share. So thank you, Atha. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for your meaningful talk. I hope we can uh, find the light in every moment, basically, simply by uh, being grateful for our healthy life. Um, our second speaker is Mary, uh, who is uh, the Labour Councillor on Dublin, Dublin City Council. Uh, stage is yours, Mary. Uh, Mary, your camera uh, is off and you're still muted.
OK, we can. Um, is it OK to give you the stage, Sarah? <laughs> So Sarah is a senior, uh, senior postdoctoral uh, post researcher and the director of uh, equality, diversity and inclusion at the Dublin Institute of Technology. And uh, the stage is yours, Sarah. You're on mute. I'm, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. This is Mary here. There's nothing on the top here to try and unmute myself. You're 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 on you're okay. We can hear you now. Uh, there's something about leave or join or something coming up there, uh, but you can hear me anyway. So yeah, if, yeah, yeah, we can anyway, hear you. Sorry about all of that. This is the joy of of uh, Zoom meetings that uh, um, everything seems to go wonderful, and then all of a sudden everything kind of falls no apart. No worries. <laughs> we get there. And you're fine. <laughs> So to introduce myself, Mary Freehill is my name. I'm a Labour councillor on Dublin City Council. I suppose you could say I've been there forever, for years and years. Uh, and um, uh, I, um, uh, I'm delighted to be here this evening. And uh, certainly uh, my own uh, professional work was in vocational rehabilitation, working with people with disabilities. I'm retired, of course, from my day job now, but I think it gives it gives it gave me a good background and some understanding of the human condition and the kind of challenges that we all face uh, in life. Uh, certainly Christmas is a time that uh, highlights the, um, um, uh, the, the, the kind of feeling of isolation. If you're not in a family, uh, you can feel uh, very very alone uh, and left out of things and uh, having said that indeed you could be in a crowded room and you could also feel uh, lonely and I suppose it's all about being uh, able to communicate and being with people who are empathetic as uh, Alex uh, said earlier on um, and uh, I suppose really, for the most part, I suppose people feel um, uh, loneliness when it comes to bereavement, but there can be many, many other um, circumstances that, uh, uh, that can cause loneliness. It's a feeling of feeling incomplete, certainly if you've lost somebody very close to you. Um, and uh, um, the same kind of sense of loneliness can come as a result of maybe the onset of illness or the onset of disability um, um, and not being able to have the lifestyle that we were used to. Um, retirement brings its own challenges. Uh, uh, very often we can mourn or feel lonely for our, our uh, colleagues um, and friends. Um, 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 and I think this can also be a challenge, we'll say, where there is a disability, we'll say, or a, an onset of an illness in, in a, a a relationship where the, the the that relationship the dynamic of the relationship alters um, and um, uh, these are all the kind of challenges uh, that we have and I suppose it's worth saying uh, that um, um, let's take that off there was coming up um uh, that it's the difference between aloneness and loneliness i mean aloneness is something that sometimes we we um um uh, welcome and it's something that probably a lot of us experience during the covid uh, uh, months there that i know for myself that i feel that I ground myself when I have more time to think. It gave us um, a chance to think and to 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 be a little bit more meditative uh, about our lives, and that was probably the good thing uh, about COVID. But it certainly, I have no doubt, brought huge challenges for people who are in a position to be less flexible, uh, less less mobile, being able to meet their friends, people who are living alone. Uh, it certainly brought um, a huge uh, number of challenges for them. Um, um, I also find, and I would have experienced this myself in terms of bereavement, uh, that sometimes you can go through those kind of feelings of um, uh, neither feeling um, delighted uh, or, or upset, and we call that flat affect, um, and that you're just, you're just not able to reach out to other people. And that's where counselling um, is wonderful to help people to gain insights. Um, and uh, uh, that's where it's very important to have those facilities available. We all know, of course, that bereavement uh, can be highly restimulative of earlier bereavements. And while we can be more upset than we expect it to be, very often it's a restimulative situation 
uh, and reminding us of earlier traumas in our lives. Um, so these are the things that brings us to, you know, where it's very important if we're lucky enough to have the skills and to be able to validate ourselves. And I have to tell you, as a counsellor uh, involved in politics, it's extremely important for me to have that kind of ability because you get a lot of attacks and you get a lot of uh, criticism being in politics. So to be able to have a sense of myself and to be able to say to myself, I'm OK, I did my best um, and uh, to be able to survive but you know not everybody is lucky enough to be able to do that and to have that and that's not saying that I haven't kind of felt down at times myself I think any of us who have any kind of level of sensitivity must experience certain levels of um, um, loneliness and depression at certain times in our lives um, and that's where the community comes in um, that uh, you know the challenge of connecting uh, with each other, the ability to uh, communicate with each other. Um, and I believe very strongly uh, in this uh, community building. I'm a, um, a Cavan girl and a Dublin woman. I grew up in a small town in Cavan called Ballyconnell. And at that time, when I was there a very long time ago, I can tell you, uh, there was a population of 500 people. And that's where I learned about the strength and the goodness of community. I would have seen my parents being involved and in where, you know, if there was illness or problems with a family or where the town needed to get business going or whatever, where everybody came together and supported each other. I never thought that we would gain from that because when my father took ill, he was ill for a year before he died and how the community rallied around us and, and helped us. And that's where I learned my appreciation um, of the importance of communities coming together and helping one another. And uh, I've always carried that with me. And it's funny, probably in urban areas, it probably doesn't happen quite as much. I found it interesting in Harl's Cross, where I am at the moment, um, there's a wonderful community council here. And there's a man called Tony McDermott, who has just done extraordinarily wonderful um, work in our, in our community here in Harl's Cross in Dublin. Um, and and um, uh, we all shared one night uh, who were talking that most of us who were act actively involved all had a rural background because we had learned about the value of community. But having said that, um, uh, certainly around the area here, it is really working very hard. The first thing is for us to get to know our neighbours um, uh, and I think probably to understand boundaries. Uh, you know, everybody, some people have different boundaries than others and to be sensitive uh, to that. And if, when we achieve that, then we like to get to know people in the other roads and that we have a wider um, 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 uh, circle of friends and getting to know each other. Um, um, working in the community, I think it's uh, is wonderful and where there are activities in the community, the best way for people to get to know each other really is to have to develop hobbies and to develop interests and that's where you can widen uh, your uh, community in, in we're trying to set up a, an age-friendly village here in Harold's Cross but it's at a very very early stage and we recognize the first thing we need is a space for people to come and meet and have coffee mornings and so forth and um, uh, we had hoped to have some workshops to find out what people want but COVID of course has made all of that very difficult but having said that the City Council has been very active in making contact with people who were uh, isolated and uh, we're talking about how the best way to reach people to find out what people need because that's very important that we don't look into our own hearts and think that we know what's best for people you know some people might like something intellectual some people might like dancing some people might like just to sit down and have a cup of tea uh, with somebody but it's about empathy it's about people um, understanding and we have this um, Harl's Cross Grow where we um, exchange plants and seeds and all that kind of thing uh, and I'm looking forward to the day when I retire when I'm going to be able to get involved in all of that myself when you're involved in politics you just don't have the um uh, the luxury of having um uh, of having a, a, a hobby um, 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 and uh, it's wonderful now that we have WhatsApp I think is a big help for people to be able to connect with one another uh, and that you can reach out but I am aware that reaching out sometimes 
can be a little bit difficult. And that's where it's important that communities have that, offer that helping hand where people can actually uh, be able to, to connect with one another. Uh, my own mother uh, lived until she was 98 years of age and she lived a relatively independent life up to her early 90s. But she was widowed at 40 years of age. And what I learned from my observation with her that she always recognized as she got older that she needed to keep making new friends all the time because sadly friends die and you need to keep changing and widening your circle all the time and she did that relatively well up until about her mid 80s uh, but I think it's something that's important that we just can't assume that all the old friends we had are going to be there with us forever um, and that's where Dublin City Council comes in we're working in communities uh, there's in Dublin City Council there's a community department that connects with the, the community communities and tries to put people in touch and I think that I would like to say here this evening that certainly anybody in the in Dublin City Council area or indeed any place throughout the country in Ireland um, that if you would like to know what's available what the opportunities are um, that um, it's worth getting in touch with your city council maybe your public health nurse would probably know about things uh, but you know developing new interests and hobbies and is certainly uh, one of the doors that's a great way uh, I think to um, uh, to try and widen our circles and to create new friends um, um, so uh, I would like to wish all of you uh, who are listening here uh, a very happy Christmas and I hope that you will have the opportunity of being able to um, uh, connect with people and that you can have fun and enjoyment and what we all want more than anything is a good laugh. Thank you. Thank, thanks a million uh, um, Mary for such an inspiring talk. Uh, importance of communities uh, coming together is something that should be more highlighted definitely to understand each other more and also like to um, in order to to be there for each other uh, as last but not least I would like to give the floor to Sarah Claveo uh, who is a senior postdoctoral researcher and the director of equality diversity and inclusion at the Dublin Institute of Technology stage is yours Sarah Thank you very much, Afra, and thank you very much to you and to ARA Dialogue for inviting me to this, this Let the Light In Christmas uh, evening, evening. And let me talk a little bit about myself. I'm Spanish. I am at the moment, I, I am taking this call from Southern Spain and I spent all the confinement, the marches, or the months of March, April, and May in Belfast, because that is where I used to be. I, I lived in Belfast for 20 years. Um, and now I, I, I am here uh, teleworking. Um, so this evening, I wanted to, to, to share some reflections about the opportunities of building uh, interconnected and resilient uh, local communities, uh, the opportunities that have been brought by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I know that there has been a lot of pain and loss and frustration and loneliness. Um, this has been awful for, for many people, but I think that also this pandemic has taught us very, very important lessons about our in the interdependencies, how we are all dependent on each other and, and how local communities matter now more than ever. I have witnessed all these throughout these past months, wonderful examples of solidarity in action and how this pandemic, despite all the pain have brought the best in people, that light that we all carry. So the, at the same time, I think that this crisis, the COVID-19 crisis has also made us reflect on the challenges that we face uh, in transitioning from a culture 
that it was a culture of indifference, I, I would say. Uh, a, a culture, this, we could see this all over in the media, this culture of indifference, of everybody minding their own business. Uh, there were even programs, who cares? Uh, there were um, in the newspaper headlines about an epidemic of loneliness. We are suffering an epidemic of loneliness. This was right before uh, the pandemic. Some people would blame individuals, and I don't think the problem, the blame should be placed on us individuals, but there were also structural challenges in all this. And I want to illustrate both the challenges and the opportunities that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought uh, by sharing a, a kind of personal story and, and reflections that I have made on, on this story. Right before the pandemic, uh, I had to travel to Barcelona uh, for a conference. And, and I also took the opportunity in this trip to, to meet my mom. Uh, we grew up, I grew up in Barcelona with my family. And we were, for many years, we wanted to go back uh, to the neighborhood to that neighborhood. Uh, we lived there in the late 60s, early 70s. So we were very excited about this, this little trip to, to our neighborhood. And when we arrived there, uh, suddenly what struck us was all the changes in all these years. Um, that neighborhood, that local community vibrancy was not there anymore. Uh, where there used to be the local independence retailers, like the local bakery, uh, the local cafe, etc. Uh, it was substituted by, by big chains, big retailers, um, uh, franchises for cafes like Starbucks. Um, there were, we also went to the park that I used to play, sometimes with my parents, sometimes alone, because uh, uh, in those years, uh, kids were left alone, not because the parents were careless, but because the parents uh, were sure that their kids were safe and how they were safe in the park. It was because if something happened to them or if they got hurt or they got lost, there was always a neighbor there that would pick them up and take them home because we knew all each other. That was not there. The park when we arrived there was, was empty. It was after school, but probably I was reflecting. Um, there, were, there are now long commutes to school, to work. Uh, probably kids were on the other side of the city taking different lessons and extra, extra school. Uh, after school activities. So I was reflecting on, on those changes and, and, and what happened in all these years, uh, the high mobility of people, people are moving all the time to work in one place and another. I have done that myself. Uh, very transient residents so that that tracing means that neighbors didn't know each other so, so much. And, and I, was, I was thinking about those structural conditions for a neighborhood, for a local community to keep, to keep connected. Uh, and then after the trip in Barcelona, with all my thinking, I went back to Belfast. And, and this was right before the pandemic began. And, and I went to my new home uh, in a neighborhood. I didn't know anybody there because I was new in that neighborhood in East Belfast. Um, suddenly there was this confinement. People were in their, in their own houses, staying there. And I felt quite lonely. Um, despite uh, connectedness with my work colleagues through Zoom or Teams. And one morning I get through the letterbox, a little paper and I open that paper. And this is from a neighbor, it's a little note saying, 
uh, if you need anything, if you need some, if you are, are self-isolating and you need some groceries, company, a chat, uh, just give me a ring. And I was in tears, right? There were tears of, of, of gratefulness and joy. Um, and I didn't realize until that moment how, how lonely I was. And that experience, what happened in that, in that street in Belfast, because it is a street, uh, taught me the, the potential that we, the potential of bringing a strong community and local community. After that, we organized ourselves through Nextdoor. This is a platform for neighbors. So all the streets uh, on my street, we were together all the time. We were connected. And we organized a lot of activities apart from, from checking on neighbors, knowing who were the neighbors who needed more help. We also organized like Zoom, kind of cafes or meetings, uh, a book club that was taking place before the pandemic presentially moved online and, and neighbors, some neighbors who were interested in reading uh, started participating. And the best initiative uh, was we, we wanted to create spaces for connectedness. So what we did is to think, okay, how can we do this? And we thought of the alleyways um, that they were full of, you know, the, bean, the beans and, and, and that to do all the neighbors like a big clean and, and fill those alleyways with plants for the kids to play um, and for, for the neighbors in general to meet up. And, and it is coming along. Uh, we needed support from the city council, which we, we got that. And it was, it was a collective, collective work. So in a way, this has taught me that it is possible that this transformational change towards a culture of connection is possible despite all the blackness and all the pain of, of this pandemic. And I learned from my own experience that there is really reason to be optimistic. Not only, there are many reasons to be optimistic. The vaccine is there and hopefully this pandemic will be over in 2021, but also that there is reason to be optimistic for local communities to come together more stronger and much more resilient in, in these difficult times. So a good note for optimism there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for sharing your personal experience. Um, yeah, I agree, I agree on it. It's uh, great. Uh, we are much more connected than ever, uh, especially with our neighborhoods. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I extremely hope we can like increase this uh, after the pandemic as well. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, to all uh, to all of our speakers for their heartwarming uh, talks today. This is a great moment uh, of sharing our thoughts and getting inspired by each other to keep up the, the Christmas spirit, no matter what. Uh, with this, I would like to give uh, our speakers the opportunity to comment uh, or ask questions to each other. I think Alex is coming with something, <laughs> with a question. <laughs> Am I? Oh, gosh. All right. Well, I'll come with a question. But I'm very appreciative of Sarah and uh, Demary for their, for their thoughts and, and sharing with them. And it really is to me... Uh, and it poses in a question. This is, this is a trick of mine that I, I say things and say it's a question, but it's not really. But um, just this observation uh, from both of them that there is uh, so much learning from this last year. Uh, you know, Mary's point of, of sort of the difference between loneliness and being alone and the benefits there. And then Sarah really being able to see that uh, there's so much optimism in terms of, we, we, I feel as if we've had a chance to catch up with ourselves and to find some grounding and to, to restart. So I'm, I guess I am wondering um, 
in terms of a question, I know that we have found that what this new way of connecting or these new, these new um, the functionality of connecting through Zoom and through remote sort of connection is so exhausting for some people and yet has been so freeing for others. And we at Coramila would have uh, three times a year, we'd have a gathering up here at the center and it would be you know, 150 people coming on site from Friday night into Sunday afternoon. And I know some people, even though it's this big, jolly, wonderful time of togetherness, I was learning that people were just dreading it, that they would just sort of like seize up as they'd come up the hill towards this place because the idea of being that extroverted for that long was awful for them. And to be able to gather in um, these very efficient chunks on Zoom, you know, kind of in and out, dipping in and dipping out has been so liberating for some folks that they've been able to have that control of being able to, and that boundary built in that they can be involved when they want and then pull back. I'm just wondering if Mary and, and Sarah have had those experiences of, um, particularly because we know that this probably will not last forever, that we now have this new tool at our disposal and how we think we might use that going forward. Um, I suppose I can come in there if I may. Um, um, yes, it's um, a blessing and a <laughs> <laughs> the opposite uh, in the sense that I'm finding these days that I can have two and three Zoom meetings a day. The advantage is that I don't have to leave home and uh, get there. And that's wonderful. But um, um, and I suppose we're getting used to it. I'm getting more used to being able to do business, um, you know, on Zoom and getting used to the, the mechanics of, the, 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 of it uh, and being able to handle it. Um, I still don't see it as being the alternative to meeting face to face. Um, uh, that kind of takes a little bit of getting used to. I find it, I think, quite tiring because uh, it's a bit like being on an interview board. You know, your energy's out there all the time. Um, so you can just kind of be flattened as a result of it. But in the current situation, it's a great alternative um, and it's given us a chance to connect and talk to one another. Um, I belong to a social Friday night group that where we go out and eat or uh, go to a film or whatever and chat and have a drink. Uh, so we've had some Zoom meetings and they don't seem to have taken off quite the same way as maybe our meetings have in the sense that a meeting has an agenda you have a reason to come together whereas in some ways uh, just having a social chat or having a glass of wine or gin and tonic as the other person at the other side it feels just doesn't feel kind of quite right but I suppose I mean in the current situation it's certainly better than nothing and I think it's been wonderful for people who have been able to do it and to keep in contact with each other you know it's a it's like an extension of the phone long ago for people were living in isolated areas their phone was their lifeline uh, and in some ways it's an extension of that you know zoom is is the lifeline uh, and we're all looking forward to being able to actually meet and have that sense of conviviality, uh, but it's 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 a big help in the interim period, I suppose. Um, and I think older people are kind of getting used to it. And I think grandparents, it's working very well uh, for. And that's important, you know, that it's crossing the the, the age divide. Yes, it is very important that el more elder uh, uh, older people um, um, learn. Um, Zoom, how to use Zoom, and how to use different social media, um, because actually not being able to do that, it can lead to a kind of digital explosion, and, and that can be a big problem. But about your question, I think that, that uh, remote working has brought um, a lot of advantages disadvantages as well and I would I would support and I would hope for a kind of blended model after the pandemic because working these working from home what has has contributed to a kind of revival uh, of, of, of local businesses for instance and and, 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 and 
community life because people before they were in city centers, they, they, they left in the morning, they wouldn't return until the evening. And these, these neighborhoods were empty during the day. Now, if we are at home, we can go to our local shops, we can go with our local cafes, provided they are open, of course. Our local libraries, maybe as a, as a working hub, if they are open. But I think that working from home some days offers some very good opportunities for that revival, for that local community revival. On the other hand, I am aware that we need kind of face-to-face -face interaction um, in work, for example. Um, so, so I would hope for a kind of blended model where we, 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 we need to go to the office maybe twice a week for, for meetings, etc. And then other days of the week, we, we, can, we can work from home. Yes, but yeah, it is very, very tiring. And especially for me, it has been very tiring. Some conferences that are all day long to be in front of the screen for a full day. It, it, it is even more tiring than face-to-face uh, -face conferences where you can chat, you can go then for the coffee break and chat with other colleagues. So that is not so possible doing it remotely. So, yeah. It has a Thank you so much. Hmm? Your point was very well made there. Uh, I just thought, um, uh, Sarah, uh, you know, about needing maybe um, uh, hubs in communities for people to come together to connect. I'm sure people must find um, uh, it's very isolating. You know, you miss having a cup of coffee with your colleagues. Um, um, even the 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 the, the, the the news about what's going on in the organization uh, mm. um, that uh, having, I think it, that's interesting for me as a local politician, you know, whether we should be looking at if this kind of thing is likely to go on, uh, for, you know, we need to approach this in a different way about libraries, about various places where people can actually come together um, and talk to one another and particularly people of particular interests and so forth is good. And may I just ask um, um, Alex about uh, uh, Cor uh, Corrie Mila. Am I right that you also have a place in the Dublin mountains, um, which was a marvellous place of peace and reconciliation? Uh, is that the same organisation, Alex? I'd love to be able to take uh, credit for the Glen Cree um, Centre for Peace and Reconciliation, but Glen Cree uh, has a long history and connection with Corrie Mila uh, but it is distinct, and uh, but it's just a fantastic organization. Yeah, in my head, there, yes. But the point is that you're in the business of peace and reconciliation. Correct. Uh, and you must have huge uh, skills. Uh, I, I personally do not, not, but I have an amazing well, group that... Institutionally, yes, uh, yes. you know, in bringing people together. Yeah. Uh, which is very valuable. Uh, uh, Absolutely, and I and I'm just thinking about what what Sarah and yourself what you were saying. Um, it, this tool that we have is a nice kind of extension of community. Um, but I would say that we found in this last year that it doesn't work to create community. Um, you know, we we have we have kind of house groups. You know, kind of clusters of the community that that meet regularly. And there was talk of trying to, even before COVID, trying to talk about making one that would that would exist online so that people who weren't physically close to each other could do this. And they may make a go of it because they're brilliant humans um, and are good at sort of doing these sort of things online. But it was my observation that it was harder to simply start from scratch a new group and say, okay, now let's do this online there's a sense that we might be able to artificially keep previously existing community alive and extend what is a little bit further with this tool. Um, but what Corey Mila knows is that it's very hard to uh, bring peace and reconciliation through an agenda because you don't do it through a meeting and an argument. What we've learned is that you do it through relationships and just getting to know folks. That if you can build a better relationship, then whatever sort of uh, resolution to a conflict 
will occur not because you've imposed your answer on someone because they'll reject it, but because in the space you create, uh, something new might be co-created. And that happens by having casual conversations, um, asides, um, unplanned realizations of connections and you know un, unexpected encounters on the way down to the loo or a, around a cup of tea. So those physical um, elements are not just ornament. They really are the, the, the fertile ground for how peace and reconciliation is more likely to take place. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think perhaps the WhatsApp, I think, plays um, mm. a role in all of that. I have noticed in my immediate community that there's a WhatsApp and people are saying, look, I have... Uh, this extra sofa, I don't need it. Uh, anybody need that, you know, and there's this, or something has broken. Uh, how do I, you know, and there's, it's, I think that that has done terrific things for, uh, um, to help one another, but to help to get to know each other. So in a way, almost having a problem uh, is an opportunity to get to know your neighbours. So yeah. I think that it's a good community building uh, tool, apart from security as well. You know, something goes wrong, people can get to know it. So I suppose it's using all these new tools, but I suppose in a way it's about, I mean, I'm very conscious that, you know, we're just talking about all of this. We're used to going out there, used to getting to know people, but I'm, I'm very, you know, conscious of the fact that there are people who find it very difficult to reach out, you know, who need people to reach out to them. And it's about being prepared to do a little bit of yourself and that the rest of us are sensitive and aware. And that's probably the challenge, isn't it? Uh, mm. Sometimes, you know, if people are a little bit isolated and how to be able to, to do that. Absolutely. The problem sometimes is that people, there are some people who find it very hard to receive help. I, I found that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought your story about the neighbor in Belfast, I thought that was very profound, Sarah. Oh, it was. It was wonderful. Yeah. I didn't that needs to that. be. That needs to be told over and over again, because you told it so well about what it meant. You know, here were you, a person in a city, you didn't know anybody. Um, and that kind of caring gesture uh, was just so important. And um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, people in who have always been in communities need to hear that because of what it means when a new person joins them, that there's that welcoming friendly yes home. and it was a feeling I, I was feeling welcome and then I, I connected through this with the rest of the street mm. with the rest of the neighbors mm -hmm. yeah okay. yeah so. no I, we, I think we had empathy down and out but 2020 has been a year of just exposing the power of, of empathy politically I mean you think of the countries that have done well uh, in this pandemic and it's the ones that have shown humility and empathy, and the ones that have struggled the most are the ones that have thought, well, we can beat this and we're on our own. And, you know, that has just become a farce. So, uh, you know, the, the power of empathy on the local and, and global level is, is just extraordinary to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an old saying, you have your neighbours when you haven't got your family. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, so important that, you know, that we always need to get to know our neighbours uh, if it's only for emergency, but you know, it can enhance our lives uh, so much, I think. Uh, you know mm -hmm. that. Definitely. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for the lovely insights. I think uh, we can say that like for creating new engagements within uh, communities, it's working much better than in a physical way, but the follow-up conversations can be done more successfully, I think online. Uh, I think everyone agrees on this. So it's uh, it's more likely that we can we're gonna have a, a hybrid life uh, after the pandemic. Uh, now we are moving uh, to the most weighted uh, moments, um, which is the question moments moment of the audience. So uh, please drop uh, your questions quickly if you haven't done it yet. I will have a look on that. 
Are you guys ready for the questions? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm trying. Um, Can we see the questions? Is I will be. Chat one, is it? I will be reading oh. them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. So this question is for Sarah. How, how can we escape the void of loneliness during Christmas if we can't meet our loved ones? How we, what, can we escape the loneliness if we cannot meet our loved ones? Um, I Especially would say during Christmas. In Christmas, yes. I, I would say that one way to escape that is, is to use those tools that are at, at our disposal. Mm -hmm. um, WhatsApp, uh, Zoom, Skype, uh, even the telephone. The telephone is still working. Uh, just to reach out, just to connect with people. Um, that I know that this Christmas is going to be very different to many people. Uh, because of the restrictions um, and also because of the of the fear of of of, of getting infected and all the security measures, but I think that there are still ways not to feel not to feel alone. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I have a question for Mary. Um, what do you think Christmas this year shouldn't be any different than the previous years? Well, it would be nice to think it wouldn't be any different, but the reality is that the situation is very different. You know, we cannot uh, um, meet and celebrate Christmas in the way that we were able to in the past where friends could come together, have dinner, um, visit each other's homes and so forth. We just cannot do that. Um, and uh, I think we all have to have a sense of uh, social responsibility that we can't do that. And uh, as Sarah was saying there that, uh, you know, we need to um, um, uh, find other ways of communicating and whether it's electronically uh, or whatever, but we have to distance if we're in a bubble, that's fine that we do that. Uh, maybe we need to say to ourselves that we have, you know, that celebration with our family and friends uh, at a different time in the year when things are more stable and different. But I really think it would be very irresponsible of any of us if we treated this Christmas the same as every other Christmas. You are Definitely. right. You are right, Mary. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. I have an Question for Alex, uh, how can we as a society improve our relations with our neighbors? Um, that's a great question. I mean, it's it strikes me, you know, I think it starts with whether or not we have a, a relationship with our neighbors. I mean, so many people anecdotally would talk about the fact that you know, they can live in a, in, a, in a place for many, many years and only have accidental connections with the people who are very, very close to them, um, you know, physically, geographically. So, I mean, the, the, the experience that Sarah had with that person just reaching out just speaks so profoundly to the, the power that is right there next to us all the time in making that very simple and, and well boundaried, you know, connection with those near us. Uh, so, I mean, finding time just to knock on a door and ask how folks are or to introduce yourself or to do something more exciting and elaborate when, when uh, COVID will allow us, when the vaccine will allow us, to do things like street parties and to do things like um, social gatherings. I mean, it's amazing to me the anecdotes I know of really exciting neighborhood events that become really therapeutic for folks and um, just life affirming for folks are often um, instigated by folks who are new to the area. Um, you know, sometimes folks that are, are, are new to the country who have arrived and just have the moxie to say, hey, I don't know anybody here. I think I'll do something to bring everybody together. And it turns out the folks that have been living next to each other for 35 years had never had the opportunity or never gave themselves the opportunity to be together. So it takes a little bit of a spark, but I think that um, the idea that, 
here is a huge, huge aspect of our life, our shared life that we're just not opening ourselves up to. Uh, you know, we probably have so much more to gain and so much less to fear from getting to know the folks around us uh, than, we, than we allow ourselves to entertain. And obviously that's because our lives are so busy and we feel so um, you know, stretched and so uh, um, exhausted and have so little less left to give to think, oh, I'm gonna organize a party. But if there's one thing um, I think this Christmas might allow us to do, because it is so stripped down and we have to get down to the bare uh, minimum of what we can do, let's do those things really, really well and come up with a creative solution to do something over the holiday period to reach out in a safe and, um, and, and helpful way. Thank you so much, Alex. So I will stop here uh, with taking questions because we're gonna be running out of time. Thank you very much for all the great questions. Uh, with this, I would like to ask our speakers if they can share their last thoughts before ending the panel. Well, <laughs> gosh, last thoughts. <laughs> um, I suppose, look, I, I found this evening very inspiring. Um, and uh, I suppose really what we're finding is that in all of these challenges, you know, we're finding about the goodness in people and the kindness and the willingness. And that's something that we need to um, in, encourage more and more. Um, and I suppose I was just thinking for people who are away from home, now is the time, I suppose, to be making contact with the one or two friends whom you've been in a bubble with or whatever, to make some kind of an arrangement, maybe for a meal or something on Christmas Day. Um, but uh, it's challenge is not easy. I suppose the only thing is that nearly everybody's kind of in the same boat this time, but it's not going to last forever. Uh, and let's hope we have learned very valuable lessons and uh, the examples will maybe make for a more uh, inclusive society so that's what we want and I wish everybody a happy Christmas. Thank you Mary. My last thought is one of great optimism for the new year and I would say to everybody uh, reach out and let the light in as well. Very it's very important. Um, <laughs> Thank have you, Sarah. a very, very happy Christmas. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, I will um, offer just a thought that, you know, I have been really struck by how, um, you know, I'm away from family as well. I'm American, if you can tell from my, from my accent. And um, it has just has made clear to me how important those moments I'm gonna have over Zoom uh, with family will be, and it won't be what I want, but it will also um, just reinforce why it's so important to have those connections and why it's such a highlight of, of Christmas. And with all of the noise and fuss and frustrations of the season, they're not gonna be, COVID will not be able to stop me from having that one-to-one -one conversation with wonderful people I love. And, um, and it is striking to me that part of that Christmas story that I got kind of jaded about within the Christian faith is really about um, presence with one another. That if, if we are with one another and if we see that as what is most important uh, in this life, then we have stumbled upon a great truth. So uh, we can stumble upon that again in a different way this Christmas season. So a very happy Christmas to everyone. And thank you, Afra and Dialogue Society and Era Dialogue for organizing this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the lovely thoughts. Thank you. Um, thank you, Afra. Thank you. Uh, you if you want to keep the spirit in Christmas, feed the hungry, uh, clothe the poor, forgive the guilty, welcome the unwanted, Care for the ill, love your enemies, and do unto others as you would have done unto you. So we're ending well our said. panel here. <laughs> Lovely. We're end 
Thank you. We're ending our panel here. So as all good things must come to end. Thanks uh, for every to everyone for joining and watching us today. And as a closing mark, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, to keep watching us in the future. Wishing you a happy Christmas, Christmas and a wonderful holiday. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy, happy Christmas. Bye-bye.